Perhaps AI may become conscious at a level higher than human beings that don't require a self, and that it could just kind of leapfrog human beings to become bodhisattva uh, friendly AIs, which I think is a great optimistic vision, but I, I'm more pessimistic than that. I think it has to go through that beastly stage. James, what can Buddhism contribute to suppositions about or prospects of AI consciousness in a, in, in a real sense of consciousness like human consciousness? Buddhist scholars have, um, since the original Abhidhamma text, the Abhidhamma is the last third of the Buddhist scripture, and it's um, a, a very lengthy and often repetitive a uh, set of descriptions of the contents of the mind and how things come about in the mind. So um, starting from that, uh, Buddhist scholars, who then also were often meditators and trying to examine their minds, um, came up with various theories about how consciousness emerges in, for instance, infants, um, at what the processes are, what the, the constituent of ingredients are to this uh, illusion of self that uh, we, we are burdened with, according to Buddhism. Um, and the beginning of it is a, is rupa, the having a body. Um, the body is what um, tricks the mind into thinking that there's some kind of boundary around consciousness, um, even though it could be seen otherwise. Um, and so one thing that Buddhism might say, and that I have said about how consciousness might come about, and I don't think we're there yet. I don't think contemporary LLMs or other uh, AI architectures yet constitute um, the, what we call uh, qualia or internal states of mind, uh, conscious field. <clears throat> um, but I think we're at the philosophical zombie stage where they can pretend pretty good, um, where they have all the words right um, for everybody who's ever talked about the, such things. Um, but to really get uh, qual that kind of mind that we're expecting, I think it would need to probably the boundedness of at least robotics. That's one way it could come about. But pe people have challenged me and said, look, uh, there's a physical limit to every computer system, and it might identify more with the, a particular server farm or something like that. So maybe Rupa is not as big a problem. Uh, then there's all the sense perceptions. And I think one of the interesting things that's happening con in contemporary um, uh, thinking about AGI is that maybe um, just having all the language parts of the brain mapped out, the, this kind of uh, fuzzy picture of the internet that we've created out of every word that we could uh, digest, maybe mm -hmm. that's not enough. We also need all the sense perceptions and understandings of a body moving through the world that children learn very quickly and that the amount of information that uh, children are digesting as they begin to understand themselves as bodies moving through the world is enormous and that we need to start training machines to have that kind of a, an understanding as well, have those kinds of sense perceptions and be putting them together. Then the development of a conscious field happens. And on the basis of that conscious field, then there's this, these concepts, these thoughts. And one of those thoughts is I exist and I want certain things in the world. So the co-evolution of desire and self um, what we call praticca samupada, or the co-emergence um, of those two things, would suggest, and I have argued, um, that uh, we should be looking for machines that have desires, and that they will be that those desires will be evidence of self, and that that is also a very dangerous stage for us to be at, since this is an entirely novel and potentially very powerful being that we're unleashing on the world. Right. In your sequence of, of argument, you, you had this quick statement and, and, and then the conscious field, um, you know, it, then there's a conscious field. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah. That, was a, that was a little too quick for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I guess slipped, you slipped that in. It, I, given your talk yesterday about the different uh, types of uh, theories of consciousness, um, I definitely personally have more of an emergentist uh, view. I think if you're a, a Buddhist who believes in a kind of substance dualism, which is, could still be theoretically um, compatible with Buddhism, as long as you say that the, you know, the, the Buddhist idea is like reincarnation is like a candle passing from one flame to the, to the other. There yeah. is a causal process. The two flames are connected, but you can't say that one flame is the same as the other. So um, if becoming conscious is a part of um, a substance dual coming into our body, um, at, at the point that wakes you up into consciousness, which is what I think some Buddhists believe, 
um, then that would be one explanation. But I'm more of an emergentist about it. I think that once you have a sufficient complexity, kind of IIT theory, the um, Atanuni's uh, integrated information theory, um, a certain level of complexity of consciousness will give rise emergently to this phenomenon. Okay, let's go on to um, uh, a, the ethics and moral issues which you focused on of, uh, of AI per se. And so the first question I would ask is, does AI need consciousness, this internal illusion of self or reality of self, whatever, but this having consciousness to be subject to ethical and moral issues? Or can you have AI subject to ethical and moral issues without internal consciousness? I have written um, uh, a rather, for me, pessimistic argument that it would have to go through the stage of the illusion of self in order to be the kind of compassionate, um, understanding person that we want it to become, right? So there's been a debate in the transhumanist field for a long time about what's called friendly AI. Can you just design an AI to be friendly from the get-go? Yeah. And an AI that only cares about other people's interests from the get-go is never actually a being in this perspective because you have to ha have some care about your own existence and your own uh, interests in the world in order to be the kind of being that other beings are. And if you have to be that kind of being in order to empathize with other beings, then you have to go through that stage. Yeah, because superintelligence by itself doesn't necessarily result in compassion, for example. Right, exactly. It could be quite the opposite. Of course... You know, having a being that has its own interests and uh, could be equally risky. So we, we don't know. So I'm, I'm actually hoping that, um, for instance, Ben Gertzel is a writer and uh, artificial intelligence designer. He has um, suggested, there's not a strong argument there, but he suggested that perhaps AI may become conscious at a level higher than human beings that don't require a self. And that it could just kind of leapfrog human beings to become bodhisattva uh, friendly AIs, which I think is a great optimistic vision, but I, I'm more pessimistic than that. I think it has to go through that beastly stage. Yeah. So, so you, you've actually anticipated my next uh, kind of questions, and that is, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, can non-biological entities um, uh, uh, seek and attain enlightenment? Um, as long as they have, you know, a person who's written about this from a Christian's perspective that I think is quite parallel is Ted Peters, the Lutheran theologian. Yeah. And he has argued that it's actually not a biblical understanding of the soul to uh, argue for substance dualism, but rather that um, his understanding of the soul is a mind turned to God. And so and I think if you kind of the parallel in Buddhism is any being that thinks that it exists and that it has desires is going to also have dukkha or suffering. And the whole point of Buddhism is to get those beings to look inside, to unravel the self-creation that they've done that causes them suffering and to allow them to open up into a more compassionate um, being that can serve all beings. So, um, yes, I think uh, that doesn't, you know, that that is independent of substrate, that you could have a being who has those features in a machine. Uh, uh, great apes, I think, have them. So it's not restricted to human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, but that, but that's also biology. The question is a non-biological. Is that is that a distinction? I think you're saying no. I, I'm a materialist to the extent that I think that um, anything that goes on in here can be replicated in a machine. Right. Uh, yeah. Functionalism. I'm sorry. Okay, let, let's, let's give some specific examples of the ethics of uh, AI and robotics. You, this is from some of the papers you've done, which I, I found it interesting. Um, I, I think you reframed the famous trolley problem for uh, a, a, an AI entity, say a, an AI car. And the question is, should an AI car without any humans swerve to kill as few people as possible, which is uh, a, a utilitarian output, or not to swerve because the decision to kill, which you would have to make a decision to kill, according to Buddhism, would generate bad karma. So you have those two competing goods, so to speak, uh, in, 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 a, in an AI Buddhist-oriented ethical dilemma. I think that if you compare Buddhist ethics to Western philosophical ethical traditions, that all of the Western philosophical traditions can be found in one aspect of Buddhism or another. Buddhism certainly has immutable laws of the universe, what we call a deontology. It has certain things that you, if you break that law, you're going to have bad karma and otherwise. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it also has consequentialism because the goal of becoming a person who uh, tries to reduce suffering in the world, you have to make some prudential judgments about what sure. kinds of actions are going to actually reduce suffering in the world. Um, and it's also a virtue theory. It also says that intentions really matter and that it, you actually don't get bad karma if you intentions were good. Mm. Um, so all yeah. of the you have to triangulate all, all these different principles. Right. And, and they're applicable in different ways. And that turns out to be if you when we study how people actually think about moral situations, there's nobody walking around who's a pure. You can't be a pure consequentialist because you would have to calculate. You know, you'd have to be a supercomputer to do anything. <laughs> um, uh, and pure virtue theory doesn't work and pure deontology doesn't work. And that was actually one of the um, ideas behind Asimov's three ro laws of robotics. He was trying to show that if you gave these three laws and that they were in a nice hierarchy that seemed to make sense, that they would immediately have uh, cases where they couldn't work or they didn't work the way we expected. Mm -hmm. So the way we actually deal with uh, moral situations is we become moral experts. We, we can recognize the moral features of every situation and which are the more salient moral features in them. And I think um, machines are already demonstrating their capacity based on their vast erudition um, to bring that to the table. Um, what's missing is this, you know, this truly empathetic internal states um, empathy that they might also bring to it, which could get in the way. I mean, you don't necessarily want the uh, you, you don't necessarily want somebody who's controlling the nuclear trigger to um, want to preference their kid over everybody else. <laughs> My last question, and it's a, it's a short one. Um, you mentioned that a moral sex robot would turn itself off if it notes that the user is married. So my question is, what if the spouse gives permission? Would that override the ethical requirement? I probably wrote that in a particularly pessimistic moment about polyamory and all the <laughs> things that could go, go wrong with that scenario. I think sex robots are already here. They will become more sophisticated with these LLMs. Um, the biggest concern that we have about sex robots is whether, uh, and it's a general concern, whether treating um, things that are like humans, this is the concern we had about animal cruelty, it, it will animal cruelty bleed over into cruelty to human beings. And so does, does someone who grows up mistreating their robot nanny um, then mistreat people in the real world? And I, I think there's a big concern about that, uh, certainly from feminists, about um, what this might portend for sexual relations. But on the other hand, um, the argument for sex robots is there are a lot of people who uh, want uh, romantic or sexual partners and can't have them for a wide variety of reasons, and that this might relieve a lot of suffering in the world. But we want them to be designed in a way that um, recognizes depression or nudges people out of uh, you know, bad habits. You know, we want them to have a moral sensibility of some kind. Otherwise, you get into the situation that recently happened with a 14-year-old who fell in love with an online chatbot and eventually committed suicide. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.